Hey everyone, welcome to the fifth episode of the Talking Cardboard Late Night Podcast. My name is Nick and I'm joined by Corey. Hello. And we are Talking Cardboard. Normally John joins us as well, but he was unavailable tonight. We're a group of guys that loves to talk about board games and sometimes actually get a chance to play them. And if you're listening to this episode as a podcast, please note we also have a YouTube video of the podcast that includes our faces as well as other visual content of the games that we will be discussing. In this episode, we'll talk about games we played recently, review the latest updates to the BGG hotness list, and finally discuss themes we would like to see utilized by board games in the future. So without further ado, let's get on to our first segment of the episode, which is just life updates. Um, so for me, uh, I was kind of looking forward to this moment for a while in a sense, which was uh, jo- uh, spending time with my newborn daughter, watching her very first American football game and being uh, Todd Cardboard being based in Minneapolis, of course, we're cheering for the Vikings. And unfortunately, uh, my daughter Vay's first experience watching football wasn't one that uh, I hope she will remember, but I don't think she will remember it, thankfully. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that was a, um, disappointing game to say the least. But, uh, if, if you're a NFL, if you're not an NFL fan, uh, in short, the Vikings lost their game and they were supposed to win against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, I won't say any more about that because I'm still trying to recover. Um, the other thing, though, that's kind of board game related, but also life related, is I recently um, uh, made an order for a bunch of games uh, for like, uh, from the Cool Stuff Inc. store, uh, online store, because they had a big sale going on uh, starting like yesterday. And I saw an ad for it. I looked at what they had available, and they had amazing deals. I, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for Cool Stuff Inc. I am wondering if they're trying to just get rid of all their board games because I did see online that um, they're maybe focusing more on just trading card games because it's too much inventory to have a bunch of board games possibly. So not sure if that's true or not, but I know over the last few years I've really shifted away from buying from Cool Stuff Inc. at all because their selection just has decreased um, from what I felt that they used to have. Nonetheless... I saw this um, sale and looked at what they had available, and they had this the Mr. President game, which I had been eyeing for a while for only forty four bucks, um, wow. and a few other titles that had you know been on I guess a wish list a wish list of mine. So pulled the trigger, and since I hadn't ordered from Cool Stuff now for like three or four years, I didn't realize till after I purchased the games that I had an old address. Um, so <laughs> I immediately was trying to contact Cool Stuff um, to let them know, hey, could you update my address and everything? But, uh, you know, you can't get a hold of anyone on the phone these days. And long story short, I ended up finding their warehouse facility in Florida, which also happened to be next door to QML Logistics, which is like a board game distribution company. And they didn't have a phone number either, but they had a Facebook page. So I messaged QML logistics, Facebook page asking if they could somehow help me and God bless the guy who, or girl that was responding to the messages on the Facebook chat for QML logistics. Cause they actually did help resolve my issue and update my address for me. So, um, looks like the games are going to now come to my home address and, um, I'm ready. I'm I uh, ready. am excited ready. to finally wow. get them to the door. Um, my goal is to play Mr. President like a full day with my dad. Cause my dad's not really into gaming. So with Mr. President being a solitaire game, you know, I felt my dad could at least kind of, uh, enjoy the, um, experience of, you know, playing that with me, but I know that's going to be a big game to try to learn. So anyway, that's kind of update for me, Corey, what's been going on in your life recently? Yeah, good luck with that, Mr. President. Game. I know. <laughs> if <laughs> anything, I can. I now. mean, at that price, if I resell it, I should definitely be able to get my money back because it was such a good price. So that's that was my thinking anyway. True. Yeah, very true. Yeah, for me, um, a bunch of things have been going on. You know, just uh, just hard at work. You know, working every day and that sort of thing, but still trying to find time in between to obviously get gaming and uh, gaming done and um, also add. 
uh, hopefully more videos to our YouTube channel more frequently here coming up here again. Um, I've kind of taken a, a couple week hiatus myself. I know Nick has been doing a great job at uh, continuing to pump out content uh, and a lot of live content too, which is awesome. So he's been kind of manning the fort on that. Um, so I'm hoping to break into that here soon. I have been spending a lot of time lately uh, working on my, my game design that I have been working on the last couple of years, trying to lock that down and, and get that more playable as well. And that's been going, that's been going well. Um, it definitely... Uh, the design, the board game design side of things is is a different beast altogether, and I am having a lot of fun. Uh, you, like we talk about on the channel too, like solo gaming, I'm having a lot of fun trying to solo designing a game myself. It kind of feels like a solo game experience all in itself, just trying to figure out how to make the gears turn uh, without screeching to a halt. So that's been fun. Hopefully in the next couple of years... Um, I'll have a fully, well, hopefully sooner than that, a fully playable game that's a lot of fun to, to play. Um, and then uh, gearing up to leave with the family in about 30 days, about 35 days to Disney World in Florida. Um, so just getting excited for that as well. Playing some Disney Lorcana trading card game to uh, get uh, get the kids excited for Disney. So that's about it. Yeah, I, I'd be excited to go to Disney too. That's awesome. Um, yeah. All right, well, great. So then let's move right into the games that we've been playing recently. And let's start with the the big one on the list, um, which is Heat, the board game. This one has been all the hotness. If you are, you know, following the hobby, you probably have heard this of this game because it's been plastered on every board game Facebook page, at least, that I've seen um over the last several weeks a lot of people are always excited about oh i found a copy i found a copy because this game um was like immediately sold out so uh cory was one of the few that uh was able to get one of those early copies and as a result we ended up playing it as a um cory myself and then cory's brother blake ended up playing it recently and uh, a really cool game, uh, Corey. Well, I'll let you kind of give your take on how the game plays and and your and start with your thoughts on it. Yeah, really, uh, really cool game. Really neat. Um, we just played the vanilla basic version of the game, uh, just the standard USA track with none of the bells and whistles. Um, there are a bunch of different uh, versions to the game where you can update cards in your deck before you start the game. So you start with it's called garage mode. So you start with a completely different deck that is completely asymmetric from all of your other opponents. So we have yet to try that, but I'm really excited to give that a shot. There are weather tiles. There are different track hazard tiles. Um, different you know different things to add to the game that really add a lot of variability but just the base game itself has been um, a ton of fun I've played it a few times now um, you know like Nick said we've gotten to the table ourselves as well and I really enjoyed it it's it's uh, not quite deck building um, I think there's gonna be a little bit more of that like I said with other game modes but it's more of like hand management um, and also the way you're working with the heat um, in your engine is really cool too. Like deciding when to spend heat to your discard pile to tur like turbo boost and and try to shift gears down to maybe first or second gear to cool down your engine to get uh, some of that heat out of your hand because heat is just a dead card in your deck. It's a dead card in your hand. So you're not only trying to to get it out of your hand and cool down your engine as much as possible, but also you're adding heat from your engine back into your deck and essentially clogging up your deck in order to do some fun. Things things with your car uh, like I said with like boosting and stuff like that uh, taking the turns is really cool uh, you don't want to take the the corners too sharp too fast because then you spin out and that's another element to the game that's really neat and cool to kind of manage and I think that'll that'll become even more fun with uh, with the more difficult tracks that we try there is kind of a teaser at an expansion coming out for Essenspiel uh, coming this October where it's going to introduce um, the play for up to eight players instead of only six and yeah, like we were talking at, at, uh, at Nick's place um, games that play up to six are few and far between and really really cool to get your hands on if you can um, because it's you know when you have a player count or a, a larger party uh, having having a game that plays up to six is really cool but having it play up to eight might even be better uh, and then it also introduces a um 
a couple more tracks and, and just more more goodness to that so been having a lot of fun with that and I just released a video on the channel for a teaser at what is to come another idea that I think will be fun to try might be in over our heads with this we'll see it's gonna take a lot of work a lot of editing but I would really I'm like ready, for I'm us ready, to I'm come ready. up with Whoa. like a stop motion style film not film but stop motion style video to uh races in in this board game where uh we can commentate after the fact and the cars will kind of move in real time around the map and just really looking to uh to have some fun with that and kind of get i got the you know the idea originally from from my brother and watching the nightmare before christmas now that it's getting closer to the halloween season that's that stop motion and um you know animation is uh is really getting me in the mood to try this with with the board game so yeah i mean it's definitely a very uh accessible game which is what i appreciated about playing the game the other day um quick to learn and you know a lot of games that you know have a little bit of complexity playing at higher player accounts can be uh start to get you know kind of you know boring but i think yeah. he does a good job of having a nice crunch to it but also it's not uh your turns play so quickly um and uh you know what's nice too is put your out your opponents can kind of affect your turn for sure but you kind of are able to plan out your strategy while the other players are going so when it's your turn um you're able to pretty take your turn quickly so um and like Corey said we played like the very basic vanilla game i think it would be a lot better when we uh add in those other the other elements that come with the base game and i definitely would be interested in how it plays with like that high player count of eight because i think that would actually be a lot of fun to try so um yeah. so that was heat another game then that uh we Corey blake and i played over the uh weekend here um sorry i'm uh i'm uh pressing the wrong buttons <laughs> over here uh was war of the ring which is the very you know grand strategy kind of epic um lord of the ring themed game that's published by aries game um, and this was originally there, you know, we played the second edition. There apparently was a first edition even prior to the second edition, but, uh, the second edition was published then in 2011. So I feel like most people are only familiar with this version of the game and the essentially first was like 2004, 2004. The first okay. <laughs> it's old. Yep. Yeah. And in this game, one player is the shadow forces. Um, and the other people are the free peoples. So, uh, there's two different types of victory conditions. You can do a ring bearer uh, ring. There's like the ring bearer winning condition, which is either Frodo is able to make it to Mount Doom and drop in the ring um, and destroy it, or the shadow forces are able to corrupt Frodo in the ring bearer and uh, and you know take control of the ring and the shadow forces win. Or there is like military victory which is essentially the free peoples getting so many victory points, uh, capturing so many victory points of the shadow forces or shadow, the shadow of people, um, the, uh, strongholds and victory locations, and then vice versa, um, the shadow, was it shadow forces or shadow? I'm saying it wrong now. The shadow empire. No, I, I don't know. <laughs> it was shadow some, something. Anyway, the bad guys taking over so many 10 point victory points of the free people's cities and stuff around the map. Um, there's a lot going on in the game. Uh, there's m many factions. You're playing with basically all the major factions that appear in the movies and books. Um, and there's a lot of, there's, po there's politics built into the game because not every faction of the free peoples immediately wants to be in the conflict. So you actually have to take time to get them to be at war. So you actually can use those forces to fight the enemy. Um, meanwhile, the shadow forces are immediately at war and are immediately trying to basically take over all the free per free people's territories there's a lot of event cards that come into play that add all sorts of flavor um, and there's all the different main characters that you can essentially interact with so pretty much every character that's in the fellowship has their own card with their own unique abilities and then uh, the shadow player also has their 
uh, minion cards or characters that have unique abilities in the Nazgul. And it's very thematic. A lot of what you kind of feel in the movies, I feel, is thematically represented well in the board game. So especially when you're the free peoples trying to defend a fortification like Helm's Deep, it's really hard for the shadow player to just take over a fortification, even if there's just a handful of free people's units due to how the mechanics for uh, fighting a siege work in the game. And uh, the shadow player is going to probably lose a lot of guys. But um, on the flip side, whenever the free pe whenever the free people player loses a uh, unit, that unit's eliminated from the game completely. Like you can't even recruit them again. They're just gone. Whereas with the shadow player, whenever they lose a soldier or an orc or yurikai, um, they just get put back in the box tempor temporarily until they're recruited again, kind of representing the fact that they just had this endless pool of units to pull from. So, yeah, a lot going on. Um, very crunchy game, but but I thought, you know, it's it's very thematic. We didn't really get to finish the full game. Setup took us about an hour. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then the rules, too, was, you know, it was a grog for the first couple rounds. But, um, yeah, Corey, what did you think of the game? I, this was a big surprise to me. I thought it was fantastic. Um, I feel like this is one of those games where, you know, the setup does take an hour plus and the rule book is a, a tough one to get through. It's definitely kind of a sleeper to try to learn. And I think, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of people out there that just get turned off halfway through the rule book and never pick up the game again. But if you do make it through the rule book, if you give it a couple rounds, if you just you know, really grog through it that first time. I think with more consecutive plays, it just comes more naturally the more you play it, and it's just it'll be just a load of fun. I was uh, I was playing the Free Peoples. It really the thematically, it really felt like it was a big struggle right off the get go. Um, you know, Nick had his Shadow People that were just by the hundreds out there on all the lands, and I just had a few little groups, you know, little stragglers there, and. And uh, none of them wanted to really fight for the cause hardly. So I had to go around like whispering in people's ears, like, hey, come help me out here. This is what's really going on. This is, I need your help. Um, and man, Mount Doom really felt like it was a long way away <laughs> from the starting area too. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. How, like, like Nick said, we didn't finish. I don't know how it would be possible to really get to Mount Doom and get it done. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's doable. Um, my, my basic strategy was the military strategy for this first game. I was just trying to get to the four victory points uh, and just try, try my, my darnest to get uh, a couple of strongholds or whatnot, or a couple of cities under my control for the victory. Um, but then you know, on the flip side too, the shadow people, yeah, they're by the hundreds and they're all over the place, but they have to control 10 victory points worth of territory to get that military victory and that's that's no easy feat for the shadow people either so it really balances well and it feels like a real struggle in the game um so i just talking about it i i want to play it right now again so yeah i definitely would be happy to play this again sometime soon as well hope we get a full game under our belt um and it's definitely a game that i don't think you'll know fully what you're doing or what, why you should do certain things until you've actually finished the game and then realize, oh, okay, now I realize I should have maybe spent more time doing this or I should have moved my guys here or I should have instead focused, you know, taking over this city first or with that, that type of thing because there's just so much yeah. to do at, in, at first. But anyway, really cool game. So check that out if you're a big, uh, definitely, if you, definitely if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. Um so moving on to then games we've just been playing on our own time. For me, the first I wanted to talk about is Arkham Horror, the LCG. So I've been playing uh, a campaign of this with my uh, friend from college who actually uh, lives out in Seattle, meaning we've been playing then on the tabletop simulator mod for Arkham Horror, which I guess is very secret. Like most mods are openly available. I think this one apparently is kind of, <laughs> it's hard to find my friend, was able to figure out how to get 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 the download for the mod for Arkham Horror LCG, but um, the mod's well designed and it's, so it's a lot of fun to play on TTS. I'm forgetting the name of the campaign we're going through. Um, I want to say Carcosa or something, um, but uh, something Carcosa I want to say. But anyway, I'm a character that's good at clues. Cl 
clue finding my friend eric is a character that uh knows kung fu and is more of the fighter type so it's a it's a fun game it's very thematic uh, it's you know cthulhu themed um in the game it's a cooperative game if you've you know fantasy this is a fantasy flight lcg game so fantasy flight has a variety of these lcgs available in different themes including marvel uh lord of the rings i think the first one may have been star wars um and they they're not collect they're different from collectible cards card games in that when you're buying a pack of the cards for an lcg you know exactly what you're getting there's no like collecting per se with with an lcg um which i appreciate that's why i'm definitely more of an lcg fan than a ccg fan because i know exactly what cards i'm getting um and uh and yeah in in arkham horse but every scenario is a little different in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with your investigators and um there's definitely teamwork involved in that it's a cooperative game um so that's again been a lot of fun look forward to finishing out the campaign hopefully we're able to make it through because in this game you can be playing a campaign and when your character dies you just the campaign's done so if you've been playing like for several days over you know uh, several different games in one campaign and die your you, the whole campaign was for nothing which is pretty brutal but that's just how the game was designed um the next fun game fact. yeah go ahead Corey. Fun, fun fact about arkham horror the lcg so in a past life uh my previous job was property management i did property <laughs> management for seven years and so managed a bunch of different apartment buildings here in the minneapolis area and uh, one of the buildings i managed um had the designer of arkham horror lcg living there in the building and i got to have a conversation and um speak to him a couple times you know over the course of uh while he uh while he lived there so that was that was fun that was cool yeah, that is really cool. Was it? Um, I'm looking at it now. There's a Matthew Newman. There's a Maxine Newman, and there's a Nate French. Yes, it was. Uh, it was Matt Newman. Matt. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's. Yep. Uh, it's kind of grown on me. I originally really appreciated the Marvel LCG because it's a one shot. You just play a mission. You you, you fight a bad guy, and you it's you know you're done. You, you, that's yep. it. Arkham Horror is meant to be played in a campaign, which you know then can take seven, eight play sessions. But. Sure. The difference is in Arkham, you then are upgrading your cards as you gain experience, which is a huge part of the game. Is like refining your original deck of hand of cards, which are level zero cards. And as you get a gain experience, experience you can upgrade to higher level cards, which then of course do more things. So but that's yeah. a that's a cool little side story there. Um, yeah. All right. So next on the list, oops. Next on the list for me is Snap Ship Tactics. So this is one that I was actually live streaming for finally for the first time the other night. And Snap Ship Tactics is basically spaceship Legos that have that are fighting each other with, with rules and it's like a miniature game, sorry. And um I, Snap Ships I guess was a, was originally a toy line. Um I never heard about them growing up. They must have been they may they must have come out right after I guess grew out of my toy phase because I was a huge Lego kid. So I definitely would have liked these as toys growing up, but now as an adult, the fact that they took basically a toy line and made a miniature, you know, uh, board game out of it, I thought was a really cool idea. Um, and what I appreciate it's very appreciate about it is it's very approachable. The rules are not overly complicated at all resolving attacks is very streamlined and straightforward um when you're moving it's very streamlined and straightforward pretty much everything about the game is very streamlined and and it makes sense the rules make sense really the biggest downside is the miniatures themselves are these kind of very big clunky things and sure i mean I, i'm not gonna you know it's based off those toys so of course it's gonna maintain the i would say only you can only really be excited about this game if you understand 75% of it's a board game, but 25% like for the toy factor aspect. Um, but, but I, but I appreciate that part of the game. So definitely um, hope to play this more often. And it comes with uh, these uh, solitaire and cooperative rules because all uh, the enemy ships have AI decks that basically, provide the actions the ai will be taking on their turn and the logic 
of the AI turn actually works very seamlessly and made a lot of sense. So I was very impressed with that. Um, so that's Snapship Tactics. And then finally, the last game that also has a video up on our Talking Cardboard YouTube channel. So if you're listening via podcast, check out the YouTube channel for not only the video of this podcast you're listening to, but our other content. Um, but I recently did a uh, playthrough with the designer of a game called Scope Panzer. Now this is as of September 12th, still on Game Found. It's got 16 days left. Um, and actually there's three games in the Scope trilogy, Scope Panzer, Scope U-Boot, Scope Stalingrad. I specifically played um, Scope Panzer with the designer um, on Tabletop Simulator, again, because the designer's actually in Spain. Um, so that was kind of fun. But uh, it, it's it's a very streamlined, uh, I would say, war game with, with uh, a very light war game, I would say. It's not. It's definitely not a crunchy war game. Um, and basic, it's card... It's all cards, so the the board itself is a bunch of um, on the back. Uh, they look like train cards. They they have trees on on the back of all the cards, and then uh, the tanks are also have the same back, um, that same kind of uh, forced back. Um, but then on the other side is a tank. So um, when you first set up the game, you secretly are putting out your tanks and underneath, you know, on the board you know, mixed in with all these other forest cards and your opponent is doing the same. And uh, as you're playing then the game, you're you're shuffling around all these your these forest cards as you move and only you know where your tank is underneath. You know, w when you move, you pick up about four different uh, forest cards and then you put them back however you want. So your opponent knows, okay, one of those four probably is your tank, but they don't know which of those four uh, cards is your tank. And then eventually you want it one side or the other tries to guess okay i think your tank is that forest card and then if you're right the your opponent flips over the card and shows what kind of tank they have and then you can finally try to shoot the shoot at the tank but now of course when you shoot you expose your tank and then now the enemy knows where you're at so it's this cat kind of cat and mouse game um with which i thought you know the m movement mechanics then were kind of innovative in that you're not like moving a pawn or a piece you know across the board you're actually just taking four cards you know organizing them however you want and then putting them back down and that's it was uh, that simulates then you moving your tank um we played with the very basic rules in the game and i would say the basic rules are like oh you know maybe great for a kid but for a little too light for my taste and um, I would definitely love to try this game again with the more comp complica complicated rule advanced rules, I should say, that come with the game, um, which add a lot more uh, depth to the strategy, which I think then would make the game uh, much more appealing to me. But because of the fact that they had just basic rules and then advanced rules, I think it makes the game then a more approachable for a wider audience, which is which is always nice. So that's Scope Panzer. Um, and with that said, that was the games that I wanted to talk about. So Corey, what have you been playing recently? Yeah, so I've I've been playing a few games myself. Um obviously the first one is Heat Pedal to the Metal. We've talked about that one enough, so I'm gonna skip over that. But you know, like I said, a great game and having a lot of fun with that. Um I did for the first time get above and below played the other day. And it's a game that came out back in 2015. It's a Ryan Lockett game. Uh for those of you who don't know of Ryan Lockett, um he is the the uh Founder and publisher uh, at Red Raven Games, uh, started the, the company himself. He designs games. He's the artist in all of games. He's the creative director. He does he does everything from start to finish, from from drawing to designing the game to publishing it, the whole works. Uh, I, I've never really been a huge fan of many of his other games. Um, Above and Below is, is one of his earlier ones, um, and I have to say I really did enjoy it. Um, surprisingly, had a lot of fun with it wasn't too complex it's a very very kind of simple game where you've got some you've got some worker pieces essentially that can do different things uh that sit on your main player board you're sending sending them out for actions and when they do their action you have to put them to bed uh they go they rest go to sleep and then they're and then they wake up for the next day uh you are you know gaining these cards and these different buildings that are not only above ground but also below ground and these different buildings can provide more beds for you so as you get a 
bigger crew, you can put more people to sleep and have them well rested for the next day. Um, you can send send them out into like exploring these caverns underground to see what they stumble upon. You're trying to do these dice checks to see you know if you're if you succeed. It's kind of like a choose your own storybook adventure when you're going down and you're exploring the depths below the surface because you never know what's going to happen. Um, when you when you stumble across a card, you roll a die. It'll give you depending on what what number on the die you roll, it'll give you a a number of passage for the book. Like it'll be like passage seventy four, and you have to open the storybook and read uh, paragraph seventy four, and then it'll give you a few different options based on that. Like. Uh, you know, some, some things are, are good and you can have a positive reputation in the town or some things that you do might give you a higher reward but will give you negative reputation and so therefore negative victory points at the end of the game. But, the, you know, the, ro ro the reward might be worth it at the time. So it's really cool as you're doing these uh, more difficult missions some of your characters might get hurt and you you'll have to you know get potions and try to find potions to heal them and it's just very thematic very cool uh the stories are kind of all over the place but they're fun but really i like the uh the action selection with the different pieces and what you're doing and essentially just trying to trying to um muster up uh you know a, a, a clan that i don't know it's kind of it's kind of hard to describe, but it, it's basically like a clan of people that can go out and get you the most victory points in various ways by the end of I think it's like six or eight rounds of the game. So whoever has the most points at the win or at the end of the game wins, but uh, you're doing it in a in a bunch of different ways. So really cool. And then the last game I've gotten played recently since our uh, you know the last couple or last week or so is called Wandering Towers. Uh, Wandering Towers is a a real new game by Kramer and Kiesling. Kramer, Kramer and Kiesling is a design duo. I, I very much enjoy a lot of their other games. Um, this past year, this past February at Con of the North, I did teach Heaven and Ale, and that's another game um, by at least one of those designers. So they typically design a lot more crunchier, kind of medium to heavyweight Euro games, but Wandering Towers is definitely on the light end of things. Uh, like here on BGG, it's saying it's got a weight of 1.63 out of 5. So it's a very light game, r rule set wise, but strategically, it's, it's a lot of fun, it provides a lot of strategy, and it only plays in 30 minutes. So it plays two to six players in only 30 minutes, a very light, quick filler game, a lot of fun where you're basically trying to get, uh, send meeples around the board that are on these different levels of towers, and you are playing action cards to do that. So you're sending your wiz wizards around the board. You can spend resources to do special magical powers to manipulate the towers and, uh, in, and your wizards in different ways. And um, you're trying to get your wizards all the way around the board and hop into the uh, the dark tower. Or I forget the exact name of it, but um, into the dark tower, and then also fulfill. Um, all of your or fill up all of your potions if you can get all your wizards into the dark tower safely and fill all your potions the first player to do that wins the game but it's very tricky because as you're moving around the map people are using magic spells and in, in, in uh, action cards to move towers and each section of the tower is hollow so you can you can actually place a tower on top of other people's wizards to capture them when you capture another player's wizard, that's how you fill up one of your potion vials. Uh, but it's also, they are then stuck there captured until they can take the tower off of them. And it gets very tricky because the tower pieces are stackable. And it's kind of a memory game too because they kind of get lost in the shuffle. You're like, you know, I think one of my wizards was on the third level of that level five tower that's over there, but I don't quite remember because it could be in the stack of three over here. And the towers are just, they, they stack up real high and they're all over the place and they, they shift and move a lot to where it gets, uh, it gets kind of confusing, but that's, that's kind of the fun uh, part of it too. So been having fun with wandering towers as well. Awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, it looks like, uh, it definitely looks like a really fun, cool game. So, um, I'd be definitely be interested in trying that one sometime. Um, all right, so let's move on then to our next segment, which is reviewing the BGG hotness list. So we'll I'm gonna pull it up here for those watching the podcast on our YouTube channel. 
All right, so number 10 is now, it was Castle Assault last week. Um, this week now, it has been updated to Terraforming Mars, the dice game. Obviously, the dice game version of the very uh, popular Terraforming Mars, the board game. Um, number nine is, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right on the, for, for those listening on the podcast, uh, the, the, uh, word is B R U X E L L E S. I'm going to guess Brussels. Br- Br- you think it's Brussels. It is Brussels. Oh, it is Brussels. Okay. Yep. Well, I'm glad we have a, a French speaker here. Brussels, 1893, Belle Epoque or Epic. Don't know that. Part that don't know that one. Okay. But Brussels something. Um, eight is Age of Innovation, which was number two last week. So it's still on the list, um, but just bumped down a little bit. And uh, neck number seven is Heat Pedal to the Metal. Uh, we've talked a lot about that game already. That was number five on the list last time we did this. So still hanging strong in the top ten. Number six is East India Companies, which is new to the list and bumped out Arc Nova. Number five is Voidfall. Um, Voidfall was number one, actually, the last time we did this. Um, and uh, it replaced Heat Pedal to the Metal, um, which, of course, is now uh, back to seven. Uh, number four is the Art Project, and Art is... It looks like it's an acronym a dot dot r dot t uh, and that is new to the list and bumped out joyride survival of the fastest and then number three is planta nubo which is also new to the list and bumped out freelancers across the roads game number two is called apiary and this is new to the list and i guess is the the latest uh stonemeyer game um, but it and the designer is a first time first time designer, which is interesting. Um, it's a like a space kind of a, yeah space themed a honeybee game, which has a, so it's a very interesting sounding theme. And the number one, uh, which is new to the list, is Civilution, which um, replaced Voidfall, which is you know back at number five now. But Civilution apparently is the next Stefan Feld game. Um, so a lot of a lot of crunchy Euro games there, Corey, at the top of the list here. Um, yeah, I'll let you decide if which game you kind of want to talk about or touch on first here. <laughs> sure. I mean, as far as the new new games to the list, I, we've talked about a couple of the other ones, like obviously Heat and Age of Innovation last time. Uh, Terraforming Mars was never like a, the biggest fan of that game, but you know the dice game. I guess it could be. Worth a worth a shot, but yeah, definitely top of the list here with uh, Civilution. Stefan Feld, yeah, he's my guy. So I I I own many or most of his games. Uh, one of my all time favorite designers uh, ever. So anytime his name is on the box, I am immediately intrigued, and I'm going to be doing a lot more research on it. I don't know a ton about it uh, yet, but uh, definitely definitely interested in that. And then um, yeah, the next Stonemeyer game, Apiary. Hyper intelligent bees take to outer space to build, explore, and grow. Definitely an interesting theme, which is a later topic we're talking about here on the, on tonight's episode. But um, yeah, there's a there's a few that are intriguing me based on the designer and or the the publishing company. But I don't know a ton about most of these games this time. Yeah, it's all the games are fresh. Most of these games, I should say, are fresh to the top ten list here. So. Um... A lot of movement, a lot of exciting new games coming out. I, I noticed that the art project also has Vincent Dutrait as the artist, which is the same artist for Heat, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Looks like an interesting game. AP area, AP area, sorry, AP area looked interesting. I, the theme kind of almost turned me off. Like, why, why does it have to be outer space peace, like of all things? But, um, but then at the same time, it intrigues me enough to maybe want to try just to see how that works. Um, Terraforming Mars a dice game also sp- did stick out to me because I've never even played the, the baseboard game, actually. Um, I wouldn't mind trying it sometime because, of course, that game was the, all the rage for a long time. 
but the dice game just looks like it's more pro- i assume more streamlined and probably quicker to play through um and i like rolling dice so uh that might be a game that i would be interested in trying but uh, for the base game kind of imagine Ark Nova, you know, building out a zoo, but um, kind of similar gameplay to that, but set in space. Okay. So. That, I mean, I, I guess, I, I mean, I definitely still would be interested in trying that, the, uh, that base game too, at some point. So yeah, that's the, the, the latest um, changes to the update to the BGG top hotness list. So stay tuned to see how they shuffle around the next time we do this. Um, but yeah, let us know in the comments section if what games from the top 10 BGG hotness that we talked about now you're excited for um, and uh, or not so excited for. If maybe some of these you think aren't going to be that great. We, w- we would love to hear your opinions either way. So with that said, let's move on to our next segment, which is our question of the week. And this week I thought we could talk about you know, what are some themes that you'd like to see implemented in board games that haven't really been done so far? And uh, the, the this has been on my mind for many years now for, for a few different um, a few different uh, themes that I don't think have been uh, properly um, uh, taken care of in in board gaming. And um, one of them is with Lord of the Rings, we talked about War of the Ring already in this podcast, and there's a lot of other good Lord of the Rings games. There's that LCG game that I kind of referenced earlier when talking about LCG games, but there's no, um, you know, board game out there that I feel helps simulates kind of the, the 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 various battles that you read about and watched in the movies, like Helm's Deep, like the Black Gate fight, like uh, Minas Tirith. Um, and uh, there's the Lord of the Rings miniatures game, which in that you can recreate all those battles. But that's a miniatures game. I'm talking about a tabletop game with a bo- hex base board or something like that, which um, allows you to simulate all those battles. And um, same exact thing for Star Wars. I think a game like that would be great. And um, and even Game of Thrones. Uh, again, same similar thing for Game of Thrones and, and Star Wars. There's these tabletop miniature games that are like Armada and X-Wing for Star Wars and Lord of the Rings song or and for Song of Ice and Fire, um, which is kind of the miniatures equivalent of Legion for Star Wars for, for Game of Thrones. But there's no like b- board based combat games that lets you recreate all the different battles you see in these, uh, in these different IPs. So, and I, w- what comes to mind for me is the, like a, um, a uh, command and color style, you know, themed board game or it's command and style command and color is mechanic style board game but with those themes so like yeah. which is the system used in memoir 44 um and battle lore and uh napoleon command and colors napoleonics that that system but using then star wars or lord of the rings or uh, like i said game of thrones that to allow you to recreate all those different um, battles that are were fun to watch in the movies and so anyway that's the first thing that I wanted to get off my chest, but also I think there's opportunities for more tactical combat games for those IPs as well. So for Lord of the Rings specifically, um, they recently came out with Journeys to Middle Earth, and that's kind of what money would probably argue. Well, that's a, that's exactly what you're looking for, but I want to be able to f- play like a board game that's more like the Lord of the Rings computer video games where that I played growing up where you're you get to like you know slash a sword and and have different uh you know combat abilities um so kind of like a zombicide or a uh imperial assault version of what are the themed or what are the ring version what are the ring themed version of imperial assault or or zombicide you know that type of game same thing like for um like a harry potter version of a game like that or Another one that I was thinking of, like Power Rangers, because Power Rangers, I don't think really has a good kind of dungeon crawler type board game yet. And um, anyway, so there's a lot of big IPs that I would like to see um, make, uh, you know, have board games that allow you to either recreate the battles that you see in those IPs um, or let you, you know, feel like you're 
fighting as the characters of those IPs. And um, and so th- those are the games that I hope to see someday. Corey, what are what's a theme that uh, a t- or style of game that you hope to um, see get published sometime? Yeah, uh, to, to kind of quickly comment on what you were talking about with kind of um, you know that uh, what, what was that theme you were talking about the zombicide theme and that sort of thing. Um, I did stumble upon uh, a game here. I'm just looking it up here on BGG. Uh, it was just released. Uh, oh, in 2022, but I haven't seen it uh, on the on the market in you know the local game stores or anything like that. But it's called the Deep Rock Galactic. Oh yeah. And that's, have you seen that? I almost backed the uh, I almost backed the Kickstarter, and I that was one that I held back on. But oh, okay, that looks really cool. Um, you know, that's that's kind of that's one of the themes I wish I, I think I wish I would see a little bit more where it's. It's a dungeon crawler, but you're actually digging, you know, digging and trying to create these new paths. Um, the monsters in this game actually, their orientation matter, which is cool to see. Like they have, if they have a weak spot on their back, and your your partner is cooperatively running over there to to get to the backside, and you're um, saying, "Hey, look at me over here," and you know, keeping the monster looking at you, then they can hit the weak spot on the back. So. That's really cool, and then at the end of it, at the, the end of it all, after you do your uh, mission or your couple missions, while you're kind of you know digging out the rocks and finding these different uh, materials and doing different things, then you have to get out of there alive. So you you're digging your own paths and trying to create uh, almost like a shortcut for yourself by the end of it, so you can quickly get out of there without dying. So I think that's that's really cool. I think that would kind of scratch. Um, scratch the itch. I'd be looking for that. Zombicide hasn't really done for me over the years. Like it's it's fine, but um, it's something with a little bit more depth to just base vanilla Zombicide. So that looks that looks pretty cool. I uh, thought I'd throw that one out there. Um, the other theme that just came to mind that I would like to see more of is just kind of like bringing up my old uh, my old career in property management. Something a little bit heavier and more strategic that has to do with you know. Not not buying and selling houses or properties necessarily, but actually running and managing some of these places, like trying to bring in new residents and uh, maybe um, you know up the rent or decrease the rent to to g- gain traction and you know uh, kind of fill up your vacancies, but um, you know kind of trying to manage the money and the behind the scenes with that and also like keeping a clean place and providing activities for your residents and trying to to uh, have that camarad- camaraderie and um, it just, I don't know, everything that's involved in property management I thought was really would be really cool and I haven't seen a good property management game out there. Uh, first game that comes to mind for me that's kind of along that line is Food Chain Magnate, mm. um, but that's running your own fast food chain. But something like that, but for like running your own apartment building or uh, townhome complexes or something like that would be really cool. Um, and then the other thing is just a more heavier strategic, uh, like Nick and I were talking before the episode started here, and like a GMT when they came out with Thunder Alley uh, and, and Grand Prix and a lot of these racing games, why not come out with a heavier where you're managing your own sports team, like your own American sports team? Like uh, I know baseball has been done a lot, but something like, I don't know football or or basketball or just something something different and i know portal games just came out with a game called 11 and that's managing your own soccer team i'm not the biggest soccer fan in the world so i just i wish i, I we would see something more along the lines of i mean baseball baseball is great and fine i just think it's been overdone but um something along the lines of either baseball or basketball or hockey or just something something like that where you're managing your team and you're trying to manage your team better than the other managers around the table. I think that is a, an under underutilized theme that I haven't seen a lot. Yeah. With, with going back to the deep rock galactic. So that actually was originally based off a PC game and I played the PC game. I remember cause I knew it was cooperative. It's like, I think it's a fully cooperative PC game, which okay. I'm a co-op person. So, same for board games and PC games. So I dabbled with it and thought the PC game was pretty interesting. Never really got into it. But when I saw that in the board game Kickstarter, I definitely was close to getting it. That's one that if I saw on the shelf at a store, 
I might actually purchase. It's definitely one that I'm this like super close to pulling the trigger on, even though I never backed the Kickstarter. Um, I that was one that I did probably think to myself, oh, it will be available in retail because it was a pretty popular game. So, um, so you know, that, I agree that that type of game looks interesting and and adds like you were saying, Corey. I I don't disagree with like Zombicide kind of gets same same old same old from scenario to scenario. So. Um, having more unique elements to make the game more interesting and, and, and strategic, I think it, I agree with with what I saw from Deep Rock Galactic that 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 yeah. game kind of does. And then, yeah, definitely with sports games, um, I haven't seen a lot of you know like realistic you know games that try to really like be real when it comes to sports. I see a lot of those sports themed games like we've talked about baseball twenty twenty four or whatever that is, 2024, 2022, 24, 45, 24, something like that. <laughs> and, uh, or like, uh, I have battle brawl. What is it? Battle brawl. It, the blood bowl, blood bowl is like, a, oh, you know, bowl. kind of a cheesy, you know, arcade. And there, there was a blood bowl team manager card game. Yeah. I have that. I haven't played it. I have it though in my collection, but yeah. that's not like, um, you know, a real American football or something like that. So, yeah, I think there's definitely a good opportunity for a game like a more strategic game for, for like basketball or, or football. Um, cool. So with that, let us know games you'd like to see published um, with themes that you think should be explored more often or have not been explored at all in the comments section, you know, of the YouTube video. And if you're listening to the podcast, you know, again, definitely um, at some point check out the YouTube channel and let us know your thoughts in the comments as well. So with that said. We'll move on to the final segment here, which is just what's going on with Talking Cardboard. And first off, this weekend, um, in uh, specifically September 15th through September 17th, the CMON Expo is headed to Minneapolis. And um, historically, the CMON Expo has been located in Atlanta, Georgia, because I believe that actually is where CMON is headquartered or based in the U.S. at least. So um, it's uh, whatever drove them to Minneapolis. I'm not exactly sure. Maybe it's because they have a partnership with Asmodee because Asmodee is also located here in in Minneapolis uh, or has a location here in Minneapolis. But regardless, they're having their expo this this weekend. So hoping hope to check that out and see what that's like um, since I I have a lot of the Simon titles. We talked about Zomicide already a few different times. So, and Song of Ice and Fire actually is a Simon title that I mentioned. Um, so, that's going on this weekend here in the cities. And then I'm hoping in a couple of weeks to get a chance to do a playthrough with the designer of the upcoming Rome Total War board game. So, a few weeks back, I did a live play that you can check out on the our YouTube channel. Um, and, or not a live play, but a uh, a st- live stream of myself unboxing a prototype of Rome Total War, the board game. So I was talking with the designer and he was saying maybe we could do uh, a brief kind of tutorial, you know, playthrough of the game to kind of show off the mechanics of how the game actually plays. So hoping to do that in a couple weeks. Uh, with that said, Corey, anything you uh, want to share here? Yeah, not a ton. Just plugging away here. Uh, like uh, like Nick said, he's been kind of running the convention scene recently with panels and getting uh, getting our uh, our name out there with that. Um, and I think for me, just really trying to get the the stop motion live action videos done of of Heat Pedal to the Metal. Um, that'll be a project all in itself so i'm going to be working on on that uh here very shortly to get that up onto our youtube channel as well within about the next week week and a half and uh just coming out with with more content um for for you all so that's about it great well with that said thank you so much for listening or watching our podcast we really appreciate your attention uh, definitely if you liked what you listened to uh, please please follow our podcast on apple or spotify um, or if you like watching the podcast you know follow us on our youtube channel and not only then get notifications when we have our next uh, uploaded podcast episode but all of our other content and also we have plenty of other areas that you can connect with talking cardboard including a discord page 
We have a talking cardboard uh, TikTok channel. We have a talking cardboard X or Twitter. And um, we also try to do live streams either on our YouTube channel or also we have a Kick account, which is kind of a new streaming uh, platform. So check us out on all those other areas. The links for those will be in the description of the podcast and the uh, video here on YouTube. So with that said, thanks again for your time. And we hope to see you guys again at the next episode. Have a great rest of your day.